Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of MongoDB World. Thank you so much for joining us bright and early. We have some exciting content for you today. Um, but before I introduce the speaker, I just want to go over a couple things. Um, first, please hold your questions until the end of the talk, and I'll just run the mic over to you. Um, and second, we do have a 15-minute turnover in between these talks, so please help us make that transition as soon as possible out of respect for the speakers as well as your fellow attendees. If you still have questions after the talk, uh, our speakers are happy to answer them outside of the room. So without further ado, please help me welcome our first speaker. He's a senior software engineer at MongoDB, working on the Rust and Swift drivers, as well as their respective BSON libraries. So welcome to the stage, Patrick Freed. Test, test. All right. Thank you, Pavi. Um, so before we get started, I just want to take a quick poll of the room. Um, raise your hand if you've ever been recommended to use Rust before. It could be by a person, a tweet, a YouTube video, blog post. So basically everybody. Um, that's no surprise. Um, uh, it's basically what I expected. So you've all firsthand experienced uh, the phenomenon of the Rust developer who loves to tell people to use Rust. Um, and that's no surprise, seeing as it was voted the most loved programming language of 2021, according to the Stack Overflow Developer Survey and also in 2020, and every single year since 2016. Um, but if you're at this talk, you probably haven't used Rust before, or at least you haven't used it with MongoDB before, and so you're probably wondering what's the big deal. Uh, well, that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, so today I'm gonna go over a few reasons why running MongoDB applications in Rust is so awesome. And that should give you a bit of an idea of why Rust users love Rust so much in general. But more importantly, I'll give you an idea of why you might want to use Mongo Rust to write your next MongoDB application. Uh, so first, I want to talk a little bit about what, uh, what is Rust. Um, so in the project's own words, uh, Rust is a language empowering everyone to, write, uh, to build reliable and efficient software. And when we say reliable, what we mean is uh, free from so-called undefined behavior. And these are things like buffer overflows, uh, null pointer dereferences, um, data races, et cetera. And you really want to avoid undefined behavior because it can uh, mess up your program in some really nasty ways. So you can have unexpected crashes, um, security vulnerabilities, and just really mysterious bugs. Um, now, most ma mainstream programming languages are free from undefined behavior. Uh, but a lot of them achieve this uh, by sacrificing a certain amount of efficiency. Um, Rust, on the other hand, strives to be as efficient as C and C++ uh, while still not having any undefined behavior. And Another thing about Rust is it strives to, to make it so that you don't have to be an expert programmer in order to write safe and fast code. And the way it achieves this is through its novel type system and a super helpful compiler. Uh, so some more info about Rust. Um, it's a really young language. Um, it's 1.0 was only released as late as 2015. Uh, and this is actually a really nice thing because that means it's not weighed down by a lot of uh, legacy decisions from a long time ago like some other languages are. It's also largely community driven. Um, in fact, it has over 6,500 open source contributors to the project thus far. And while it was originally started at Mozilla, these days it's governed by an independent nonprofit foundation uh, called the Rust Foundation, um, the members of which are representatives from some of the biggest names in tech. So it's not just a hobbyist language, but it also has some serious corporate backing. Um, so here's what some actual Rust code looks like. Uh, the syntax is intended to be familiar to C and C++ developers, on Java developers, um, but it, it borrows a lot of much much higher level constructs from like the functional programming world. So I've talked a bit about what Rust is and what it strives for. Um, let's move on to why you might want to use it for a MongoDB app. So first and foremost, Rust applications are fast. Um, and there's a couple reasons for this, but one of the main ones is that Rust applications can be compiled down to machine code. Um, and this makes them faster than languages like Python or JavaScript that need to be run through an interpreter. And because there's no interpreter, there's also no global interpreter lock like we have in Python. Uh, so that means threads in Rust can achieve true parallelism. Uh, additionally, with async being built into the language, it makes it really easy to write highly concurrent code that takes advantage of that parallelism. And this can make a huge difference for performance. And lastly, Rust doesn't have a garbage collector, um, like languages like Go or Java or C Sharp. Um, and since the overhead of a garbage collector can sometimes be a lot, uh, not having one can lead to much faster programs. So here's a pretty simple benchmark 
uh, of how long it took drivers in various languages to insert 10,000 small documents. Um, as you can see, Rust is a decent bit faster than Go and much faster than the Python driver. Uh, now for this specific example, it's actually a little bit slower than C, uh, but that's because the Rust driver is mostly optimized for highly concurrent workloads, uh, and this was just a single-threaded insertion. Uh, for a more realistic benchmark of like a web framework, uh, Rust and C will be a lot closer. Uh, so the Rust driver is fast, and that's great. Uh, but it also makes working with your data really easy. Um, and it does so by leveraging the type system. Um, the type system is actually one of Rust's most defining characteristics. Uh, it's known for being strict, but that's actually one of its greatest strengths. Uh, so let's see how. So firstly, structs in Rust are like the basic object type. Um, they're basically equivalent to structs in C and C++ and Go. And you can kind of think of them sort of similar to classes in like Java or Python. Now, for example, here we have a struct that uh, models a cat. Uh, it has a name field that's a string and an age that's an integer. And you can access these fields via dot name or dot age on the instance of cat. Um, you can also add methods to these things, like you know, objects in other languages. Uh, for example, here's a method that gets the age of the cat. Now, a super common thing to want to do in any MongoDB application is map your objects in your application to the documents that are in your database. And the MongoDB Rust driver makes this super easy by using Rust's type system. Uh, and the way it does it is it allows you to annotate your collection objects with a Rust type that models the data that's in that collection. Uh, so for example, here, uh, we've, we've annotated our collection with the cat struct that we defined in the previous slide. And what this does is now all the methods on this col uh, cat collection now operate over instances of the cat struct. Um, so has anyone in here used an ODM before, like Mongoose or Mongo Engine, something like that? Um, this works kind of similar to that but it's built into the Rust driver and it's super fast. Uh, so to give you a more concrete example of how this affects things, uh, let's implement an API endpoint handler that adds a new cat to our database. So that handler might look something like this. Uh, it's the add cat function, it takes in some state for our app, uh, the name and the age of the cat that we're adding. Now, the first thing we might wanna do is create the cat from the name and age that were provided to us. Uh, once we have the cat, we might perform some business logic, like the cat can meow, or we can pet the cat. Um, and when we're done with that very important business logic, uh, we can pass it to the insert one method and add it to our database, uh, and then return a result indicating whether it worked or not. And so this pattern is super nice uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, but for one, it let us work with our data naturally. Uh, we were able to call custom cat methods on it, and we were able to pass it functions that were expecting cats. But at the same time, it automatically handled all the serialization for us. We didn't need to manually write a bunch of boilerplate conversion code. Now, in addition to making our code more ergonomic, it also made it more correct. So when we created the cat, the Rust compiler required that we provide both the name and age field. We couldn't accidentally forget one. Additionally, it also made it so we had to provide the correct types. We couldn't accidentally provide a name that wasn't a string or age that wasn't an integer. And what this ultimately means is that this handler, it's impossible for this handler to accidentally insert something into our database that violates our database's schema. And this is really important for uh, avoiding, you know, sort of headaches down the road caused by uh, inconsistent data. Now the type system can also help out with errors that go beyond a schema violation. So let's say we have our cat collection again, uh, and we create a dog value, which also has a name and an age, just like our cat structs from before. If we try to insert this into our cat collection, we'll still get a compile error, even though the dog would match the schema of the collection. And that's because the Rust compiler knows this is a collection of cats, not dogs. And these checks sort of highlight a general philosophy of Rust. And that is, it's better to catch errors at compile time than it is at runtime. And this is for a couple reasons. One of which is that compile time errors are generally easier to debug. The, compil the compiler will tell you what's wrong, uh, where it's wrong, and even sometimes how to fix it. Um, compile time errors are also less costy, costly to debug. Um, if you have a bug in your code that causes your code to not compile, it can't be shipped to production by accident. Whereas if you have a bug in your code that only shows up at runtime, it most certainly can show up in production environments. Um, so the type system also helps out with other methods that write. So for example, again, we have our cat collection. Let's say we modify our struct uh, in some way. For example, it's the cat's birthday, so we increment the age. We can update the existing cat in the database by passing the modified struct definition directly into the replace one method using a filter uh, based on its name. So the type system also helps with read operations. Again, cat collection. Uh, let's say we wanna print the names and ages of all the cats in our collection. We'd probably start by performing a find over that collection. 
and then we'd loop over each document in the cursor. And first, during each iteration, we get the current cat. Now this statement here automatically maps the current document in the cursor to an instance of the cat struct. And it knows to do this because the cursor came from a collection that was annotated with the cat type. Now if the document doesn't match the structure of a cat, an error will be returned. And what's really nice about that is that this validation, we didn't have to perform it manually. It was done for us automatically. Uh, for example, it verified that the name was present, the name was a string, and so on. And now if this mapping did succeed, uh, we can print the name and age directly by accessing them on the cat struct that we returned. And another great benefit of this that cannot be uh, overstated is we get to use autocomplete. Um, I don't know if it's just me, but being able to hit tab to finish off whatever I'm typing is a joy unlike any other in the entire world of programming, um, even if it is just two letters. <laughs> Um, but it's more than just about saving some keystrokes. Uh, it's also about discovery. Uh, with a single dot, I can see all the other fields and methods that are available on my data uh, without referring to the documentation. And this leads to a much more pleasant developer experience. Um, and like we were saying before, working with our data this way is much more natural. Um, again, we can call custom cat methods, and we can pass our cats to things that expect cats. Um, so yeah, this mapping functionality is super nice and super useful, but you might be wondering how the mapping is actually defined. Um, and it's actually divine, uh, it's derived from the structure of the data itself using Rust serialization library, uh, SERDE, or SERD. I honestly don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> um, and the way you do it is you just need a simple macro annotation on your struct definition. Uh, so for example, to generate the mapping that we used on the cat struct in the previous examples, we just need to add this one line, and that's it. Uh, this struct can now be mapped to and from documents that look like this. Um, and this is just the most uh, default implementation. Um, you can also customize it a lot. So for example, let's say we have a third field called eye color. If you see in the document res representation, um, it's eye underscore color. And that's because the field name in the restruct is also eye underscore color. Uh, but what if our schema uses camel case for this field? Uh, no problem, we can just use another Saturday annotation and then we match the schema perfectly. Uh, and this is just the most basic of all customizations. Uh, Saturday lets you do all kinds of different things to tailor your format exactly as you need it. Either at the field level like this, or for the entire struct. Um, and other drivers and programming languages uh, sort of have some similar data mapping functionality, uh, but one thing that's different about how it's done in Rust with Saraday is that these macro annotations actually generate this code at compile time on the fly. And what the, the benefit of that is that it can use limited runtime overhead to perform these mappings, and so it's a lot faster than the mapping in a lot of other languages and drivers. Uh, now another great thing that's different about Saturday is its flexibility. So the way it works is it defines a format agnostic data model. And then you just need to define the mapping between your data and that data model. That's what we were doing before with those macro annotations. And then from there, you can automatically convert to and from any format that has a Saturday backend implementation. So in the driver, we're using this to convert to and from BSON, because that's what the server speaks. Uh, but you can use it for any other format too. So for example, here's what the JSON object format of the, of the cat looks like. Here's what it looks like in YAML, uh, and even XML. And this flexibility of format uh, makes it really easy to flow your data uh, throughout your typical full stack web application, whether it be talking to and from your front end via JSON or talking to and from your database via, Manga, uh, via the driver and BSON. So we talked a lot about how uh, the driver uses the type system to make working with your data really easy. Uh, but now I wanna move on to talk about another very special part of Rust uh, which helps ensure your data is memory safe, and that is the borrow checker. So in Rust, you'll often find yourself having to pass around reference to thing, references to things, and a large motivation for this is for performance. It's much quicker to pass a reference to something than it is to make a copy of that data. Um, but because we manually manage our memory in Rust, uh, we can sometimes mess up, make a mistake, and either create or use an invalid reference. Uh, but that's where the borrow checker comes in. It's an extra stage during compilation um, and it exists to make sure that all the references in your program are valid. And if it detects any that are invalid or any that it cannot prove are valid, it'll fail compilation. And this is a big piece of what allows Rust to be safe from undefined behavior despite not having a garbage collector. Now I wanna talk a little bit about what the borrow checker actually does. Um, in Rust, there are two types of references. Uh, immutable, denoted by a single ampersand. These allow you to read the data that you're referencing, but that's it. Uh, and also mutable references, denoted by the and mute keyword, which allow you to read or write to the data that you're borrowing. The bar checker enforces two rules when using these references. 
One, borrows must not outlive their data. Um, and the reason for this is that if you attempt to use a reference to something that's been deallocated, uh, you'll get undefined behavior. And we talked about that before, about how bad undefined behavior is, so you definitely want to avoid that. And the second one is mutable references are exclusive. And what this means is you can only have one mutable reference at a time. And in fact, you can only, if you have a mutable reference, you can't have any other references of any kind. And you can also not acquire a mutable reference if there are existing references. And the reason for this is you could easily run into a case where you have two threads, one thread that's writing to a piece of data at the exact same time that another thread is reading to or writing, reading from or writing to that data. Uh, and these situations are called data races, and they also lead to uh, undefined behavior. But that highlights one of Rust's greatest features, which is that it can actually eliminate, the borrow checker is able to verify at compile time that all safe Rust code is 100% free from data races. Um, and this is a really incredible feature that a lot of program programming languages verify at runtime um, with an overhead uh, performance cost, or performance overhead. But because Rust does it at compile time, it's completely free of any performance costs. But the bar checker can be used to verify correctness in other ways too. Um, so for instance, in, the dry, in MongoDB world, we have these things called client sessions. Um, and they're used to group operations for things like uh, calls of consistency or transactions. Uh, but they need to be used in a specific way. And if we look at the documentation on the MongoDB website, uh, we can see in bright red bold characters that applications need to ensure that they only use them from one thread at a time. But as it turns out, this is actually pretty easy to get wrong, and the users of our drivers often do, especially when using async drivers. Uh, but not in Rust. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the reason for this is because we have the borrow checker. So if you look, take a look at the method signature of anything that takes in a session in the MongoDB Rust driver, you'll notice that the session is accepted as a mutable reference. And if you remember rule two of the borrow checker, you can only have a single mutable reference at a time. And therefore, it's impossible to write a Rust application that uses a client session from two threads at the same time, because the compiler simply will not allow it. Um, and one time we actually had a user file a bug report saying that their code stopped working uh, when they were porting it from Node.js to Rust. But in reality, their original Node.js code was already broken because they were using sessions from multiple threads, but when they ported it to Rust, the compiler wouldn't let them make that mistake again. So you can kind of think of the bar checker like a parachute. Um, it's designed to protect us from getting hurt when things go wrong. Uh, but you can also use it to do amazing things that wouldn't be safe otherwise, like jumping out of a plane. Um, in Rust terms, the bar checker lets us try things, for example, performance optimizations, that would be super, mem super memory unsafe to try in other languages. Uh, but because we have the bar checker looking out for us, uh, we know it's safe. So let's take a look at an example of this in the Rust driver. So this is the previous example from before of us going over the collection and printing all the names of the cats. Uh, this is great and all, but in each iteration of the loop, we're copying the, the name string from the input document into our struct. And if we have a lot of cats, or cats with really big names, these copies can slow down our application. But if we look at the binary representation of the input document, we can see that the string is actually stored as UTF-8. And this is the same way that Rust stores strings in memory. And we can actually use this to speed up deserialization. And that's where zero copy deserialization comes in. And like I said before, making copies is slow, and so instead of copying it, we actually borrow it during deserialization from the input. Um, and the borrow checker helps make sure this is safe. And the best thing of all, it's supported out of the box by Seraday, the serialization library that we were talking about earlier. Um, so how do we do it? Uh, it's actually pretty easy. So we have to go back to our struct definition. Uh, and the first thing we have to do is update it to use references instead of own strings. Now this tick A here just indicates a named lifetime. Uh, it tells the borrow checker, basically as a placeholder, to tell it how long we're going to borrow this data for. Now tick A is just a convention that was borrowed from like OCaml or something. Um, we can actually name this whatever we want. Uh, for instance, tick doc to indicate the lifetime of the document that we're borrowing from. Uh, and then all that's left to do is tell Saturday that we're borrowing, and that's it. Next time we deserialize from the input document, it'll borrow this string instead of copying it. So now if we go back to our example, everything else stays the exact same. But now there's just no copies when we do the deserialization, and it's a lot faster. So I just want to take a, a, a deeper look here to sort of show you what the borrow checker is actually doing and what it's protecting us from. So this green box here indicates the lifetime of the document that we're borrowing from. Um, and if you remember rule one of the borrow checker, um, borrows cannot outlive the data that they're borrowing from. And what this means in our little diagram here is that we can't borrow outside of this green box. Now our code as written is okay because everything's happening inside the green box. 
But if we attempt to, let's say, return the cat's name from the loop, the reference would escape the box and the bar checker would reject, reject it. In practical, in practical terms, what's happening here is if we were able to do this return, the cursor, and therefore the document we're borrowing from, would become deallocated when the scope is exited. But we're returning a reference to that document. Um, and therefore we'd be returning a dangling reference and attempting to use it would be undefined behavior. So the bar checker protects us from this, uh, but this is something that the C or C++, C++ compiler would be totally happy to allow. Okay, so the bar checker helps pr uh, protect us from dangling references, but what else is it doing here? Well, if you remember rule two of the bar checker, um, mutable references must be exclusive. So where in this code are we getting mutable references? Um, right here, when we advance the cursor. We need to get a mutable reference to the document in order to update it to the next one in the result set. Now our code here is okay because that mutable, ref mutable reference doesn't overlap with any of the other references we have. Um, but let's say if instead of printing the cat's names, uh, we decided to add them to some sort of collection uh, for later processing. So we might start by creating a vec. So in Rust, a vec is kind of like an array in Java or a list in Python. Um, so we create this vec before we start iterating. Instead of printing, we push the cat onto this vec. Now according to rule one, everything here is okay because it all happens within the green box. But because of rule two, the bar checker will actually reject this code. And the reason for that is because after the first iteration of the loop, um, we will have added a reference to the document into the all cats uh, vec. But the next time we enter the loop, we'll attempt to grab a mutable reference to the document again in order to advance the cursor. And as we said before, you cannot get a mutable reference to something if there are outstanding references already. Now again, this is sort of abstract. In practical terms, the reason why we can't do this is because when we advance the cursor, we would have modified or basically gotten rid of the existing document that we were borrowing from from the thing that was in the VEC already. And therefore, attempting to use that would result in undefined behavior. Um, so as you can see, it's really easy to mess things up when doing stuff like this uh, if we didn't have the borrow checker. Um, but because we do have it, it makes sure it's 100% safe. And more than that, it makes it so it's 100% normal to do things like this in Rust. And that's something that's really cool. Okay, so so far we've been talking mostly about um, aspects of Rust, the language itself, and the MongoDB Rust driver. Uh, but now I sort of want to talk about something that's like adjacent to Rust, uh, and that's its tooling and ecosystem. So firstly, there's a tool for installing and managing Rust toolchains called RustUp. Um, and it is seriously the easiest way to install any programming language toolchain that I've ever used in any language I've ever used. Um, you can go from zero to having Rust in 30 seconds, and that's not an exaggeration. I tested it before this talk. Um, so that's really good for getting up and running uh, really quickly on your first project. And once you have Rust installed, um, all roads lead to Cargo. Uh, it's the all-in-one build tool, package manager, dependency manager, test runner, everything. Um, and with a bunch of sim a couple simple commands, you can create a project, build it, uh, and test it. But perhaps its most killer feature is it makes adding dependencies super easy. So in each uh, Rust project, there's a cargo.toml file. Um, and it's kind of like a package.json from the NPM world. So for example, you add some metadata about your project, its name, its version, some other stuff, but it also contains a list of its dependencies. In order to add one, it's as simple as adding a package name and a version. And the next time you run cargo build, it'll pull that dependency in and build it so you can get start using it immediately. So for example, this is how you would install the MongoDB driver. Um, and it takes you know, no effort at all. And it, grab, it gets these packages from the centralized Rust package repository called crates.io. Um, and because Rust is a community-oriented language, there's thousands upon thousands of really high-quality community-maintained packages on crates.io. So you can sort of build, you can use a dependency for whatever you need to, um, and it'll all be available for you there, including the MongoDB driver. And so in addition to uh, crates.io, there's also docs.rs, which is the centralized documentation repository for Rust packages. And what's cool is publishing to crates.io automatically publishes documentation also to docs.rs. And because they all use the same tool to generate their documentation, they all have the same look and feel. So it's very easy to navigate and find out how to use things. Uh, so for example, this is what the documentation page for the MongoDB Rust drivers collection looks like. And the source code is generated from the, uh, source, sorry, the documentation is generated from the source code, in, like in the, in the actual source code which makes it really easy to write documentation, but it also ensures that it's always up to date. And again, because it's all centralized, it's super easy to 
access, and so you never have to like go around Google trying to find out where your dependencies documentation is. Okay, so we've talked a lot about why Rust and MongoDB applications is an awesome pairing. Um, first and foremost, it's fast. Uh, you'll probably get a big performance boost by running your applications in Rust. Um, it has a robust type system, which makes working with your data really easy. The borrow checker, make sure you use client sessions correctly, make sure your application is memory safe, and even allows for super cool zero copy deserialization. And lastly, the tooling gets you up and running really fast, so you can start building your next MongoDB application as soon as you want to. So I hope this gives you an idea of why Rust users love Rust so much, um, and also gives you a few reasons why you might want to use uh, Rust for your next MongoDB application. Thank you. Cool. Uh, thanks, Patrick, for letting us know how cool Rust is. <laughs> um, we do have a few minutes for questions, so does anyone have any? Okay. I'm just going to hand you the mic. <laughs> So can you talk us through uh, database changes? So you go to Rev2 of the schema. How do you change that in the language code base, and how do you change that in the documentation schema? Yeah, so um, I guess, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. So it depends on, like, I guess, if you want to do it all at once or not. So you can maintain two different versions um, of your structs and sort of access them depending on which version of the schema you're doing. Um, you could also define this, the deserialization uh, implementation, like the mapping I was talking about, in such a way that it could handle either version of it and then access it sort of at the application layer. Um, I, but I think in general, uh, this, the schema migrations would work similarly to how you would do in other languages. Um, also, like another thing to point out, in this example, we were doing like strict schemas where the schema was known, this was this type, this was that type. Um, you could also use documents uh, like in other languages, if you have a schema that's more flexible. Questions? Oh, oh God. <laughs> well, the members of my team are in this room, so I don't know if I can pick sides. <laughs> um, I like them both. Um, I will say the Rust ecosystem is a little bit, uh, the Rust server-side ecosystem is a little bit more mature than the Swift one. Um, so for that reason, I might give an edge to Rust, but you know, Swift is up and coming, so we'll see. Um, yes, we're working on that uh, right now. <laughs> He's actually working on that right now. 